Thank you for joining us for the WDLS webinar, ALA Conference at a Glance, WDLS Scholarship Winners Report. The w WDLS offered a scholarship for library staff or member public library directors to attend the American Library Association National Conference in Chicago, Illinois this year in 2017. More information on the 2017 WVLS ALA scholarship can be found at wvls.org. Again, a quick note, this webinar will not offer any continuing education contact hours or credits. The purpose of this webinar is for the ALA scholarship winners to highlight valuable sessions, resources, and experience, experiences from the National Conference. And there will be a few minutes at the end of the presentation for questions. The 2017 scholarship winners and this afternoon's speakers are Denise Shonaki and Debbie Valin. And I'll let them introduce themselves briefly. And Denise and Debbie will have about 45 minutes to speak. And then, we'll, again, we'll have time for questions. So please don't be afraid to enter any questions on your mind into the chat box or the question box on your screen. All right. I believe first up we have Debbie Valine. Right. Debbie, if you want to tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, first of all, um, I'd like to thank WVLS for the scholarship and the opportunity to attend ALA. We're very appreciative of this opportunity. As Anne said, I'm Debbie Valine, Collection Development Librarian Bookkeeper at the Rhinelander District Library. And I attended many great sessions at ALA that I'm looking forward to sharing with you this afternoon. The first session that I attended was entitled Engaging Book Clubs in Your Community. And there are several ways that you can support book clubs in your community. And one is to offer a book club in a bag, which are book kits that contain about eight to ten copies of a book. And it's also helpful to include a book discussion guide and an author biography in the kit. If your library hosts book clubs that a library staff person doesn't lead, it's recommended that a staff person still occasionally drop in to make sure that the book club is working well. One of our speakers had a book club that almost fell apart because a couple people were dominating the discussion and other book club members were getting ready to lead the club. In 2011, Santa Clarita Public Library held a book club extravaganza. And this was a two-hour program for local book clubs and those interested in starting one. And at this event, they shared resources and tips for running a successful book club. They also used this event as an opportunity to capture emails of book club members. And they used those to send out information about upcoming author events at the library. This is an idea that we've decided to steal. And we'll be holding our own book club extravaganza next month in October. Unlike the Santa Monica Public Library, you can hold an annual community read. And it's important for the library, friends group, and community to all promote this event. For example, Santa Monica had branded merchandise, such as t-shirts that said, I've read ABC book, have you? And one year, they even had librarians reading from the book on the street with a megaphone. Um, during this session, well, we were also excited to hear from Stephanie Powell Watts, author of the book, No One is Coming to Save Us. This book was selected as the first pick of ALA's new book club central. Actress Sarah Jessica Parker is the honorary chair of the book club and will select books throughout the year. And you can check out Book Club Central's website and keep up with her book picks at the URL listed. Lastly, Jennifer Lohman from Novelist shared some Novelist resources of use to book clubs. To help book clubs select their next read, from the Novelist homepage, there are recommended reads lists, as you can see circled in the upper left corner of the first um, picture. Patrons can also search for books by genre, mood, and appeal. In advanced search, you can search reviews for the term book clubs. And I can tell you from trying this, it isn't foolproof, but it can highlight books that were called good for book clubs in a book review. 
Under the Quick Links menu at the top, patrons can access various book discussion guides. And there are also author read-alikes. So if a book club loves a certain author, they can find other authors that are similar. Another session I attended was Healthy Aging at Your Library, Connecting Older Adults to Health Information. This is one of the best sessions I attended at the conference because it was chock full of resources for libraries. It was given by Lydia Collins and Christian Minter from the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. The NNLM is part of the National Library of Medicine, which is the world's largest biomedical library and part of the National Institutes of Health. NLM promotes many databases and websites that public librarians can use to meet their community's health information needs. The National Network of Libraries of Medicine is a 6,000 member organization that includes hospitals, health providers, universities, and over 1,600 public libraries are also part of this network. Members are supported by eight regional offices, as you can see on the map, and librarians are encouraged to contact their regional medical library and see what resources and services are available to them. So why is it important for libraries to support healthy aging? Well, as we all know, Americans are living longer and the population is aging. So while we're living longer, unfortunately, not all of us are living healthier. Over 60% of older Americans are coping with two or more chronic health conditions. And at the right is a list of the chronic diseases with the highest mortality rates. Some of these conditions are preventable or more manageable through staying active, healthy eating, preventive screenings, and pursuing hobbies and social activities. And these are healthy aging practices that provide many opportunities for libraries to provide relevant information and programming. Here are some of the top aging concerns expressed by older adults and influencers in a 2015 survey by the National Council on Aging. Older adults are concerned about loss of independence as it relates to physical health, memory loss, mental health, managing chronic disease, and living independently. And the biggest financial pressures relate to avoiding financial fraud and scams and access to affordable housing. So what are the opportunities for us as library staff? There are opportunities for us to engage older adults in health, wellness, and social activities. The library can connect caregivers to community resources. There's an increased need for health information to help people cope with those chronic diseases. And there are opportunities to partner with service providers in our communities to serve older adults. Some of the health resources available to libraries and library patrons include Medline Plus. Medline Plus is the National Institute of Health's website for patients and their families and friends. You can use Medline Plus to learn about the latest treatments, look up information on a drug or supplement, get links to the latest medical research, or find out about clinical trials. Medline Plus also has a listing of health topics that are relevant to seniors and their caregivers. There's also a quarterly magazine, NIH Medline Plus, and you're able to subscribe to this magazine at no cost and have it delivered to your home or the home of sick and shut-in library users. Libraries could also subscribe in bulk to just get copies to distribute to patrons. NIH News and Health is an online monthly newsletter with practical consumer health news. And you could print one out for your collection or put some out in the rooms where programs for seniors and caregivers are being held. There are also resources for library programs that can be offered for older adults. 
And these include Go for Life, which is an exercise and physical activity campaign from the National Institute on Aging. Go for Life offers exercises, motivational tips, and free resources to help older adults start exercising and keep going. Libraries are able to order free materials from Go for Life to distribute at outreach events and programs. And there are also instructions on how you can link the Go for Life website to your library's website. Tale and Travel Memories is a library program for people with dementia-related illnesses and their caregivers, offered by the Gail Borden Public Library District in Elgin, Illinois. It takes participants on an imaginary journey to another country or region in the U.S. through books, music, folk tales, and interesting facts about each destination. And a free toolkit is available online. The Creative Aging Toolkit for Public Libraries is a free online resource for librarians and provides information about engaging older adults in participatory, professionally run arts programs with a focus on social engagement and skills mastery. There are many different ways to accomplish health and wellness, including using the arts. May is Older Americans Month, and it's a great time to offer programming for seniors in your community. The Administration for Community Living creates a new theme each year and provides event ideas and resources. Engage for Health is a health program that you can run in collaboration with a local health care provider to teach older adult techniques for improved communication with doctors. NNLM has created a website that has all of the material that you need to run this one-hour program at your library. Infographics can be a passive way to share health information. What you see here are infographics that were created by the National Institute on Aging, which tell a visual story about a wide variety of issues pertinent to aging. These are great to print and post at your library and to share on social media. Promoting healthy aging is a great opportunity to partner with other organizations in your community. So think about potential partners, and some ideas are listed here at the right, and how you could collaborate to serve older adults in your community. The 2015 U.S. Aging Survey explored how older adults participate in their community. And this graph highlights the top three activities identified by respondents. They were running errands, such as shopping, picking up meds, and so on, participating in faith-based organizations, and events with grandchildren. So how can you use this information for your library? Are there potential opportunities for partnerships here? And I want to thank Lydia and Christian for letting me access their slides. And they asked me to include their contact information for you. So on to another session. A Gail, a leader in providing library research resources, sponsored a luncheon where three librarians spoke about being an incubator for your business community. Library services they typically provide to businesses include one-on-one -on -one consultations, programs on different business topics, and connecting businesses to information and resources. Some of the top information needs libraries can help businesses with include formulating a business plan, identifying funding sources, learning about target markets, and understanding competitors. Ways that the libraries connect with businesses, Joe from the Mount Prospect Public Library said when local businesses Google starting a business, the library pops up in the top search results. 
He also works with his village hall so that they notify him when someone applies for a new business license. Both Joe and Kent attend Chamber of Commerce business networking events to collect business cards and talk about library services. Leah from the San Francisco Public Library specifically works on supporting local farmers, and so her networking is more targeted. When working with local partners, such as the Chamber of Commerce or your city government, it's important to clearly outline and divide up responsibilities based on each partner's strength. And you can educate yourself about supporting local businesses by attending business reference courses, such as through ALA or a university, or attending those business programs that your library itself is sponsoring. Lastly, Leanne Cusack from Gale talked about Gale products and databases that can help libraries support their business community. And you can find out more information about those products and databases on the Gale website. LIDA, the Library Information Technology Association, which is a division of ALA, held a session on top technology trends. First was long distance wireless charging, in which all mobile devices within a certain radius of the charging station would be wirelessly charged. So no longer will we have patrons lining our walls to plug into our electric outlet. And this technology is still expensive and emerging, but it's something to keep your eye on for the future. Second was cloud computing. The State Library of Georgia helps public libraries in Georgia replace their aging desktop computers with much less expensive Chromebooks and netbooks. And they hired a vendor to create a time and print management system for those computers. We, of course, have all heard about maker spaces by now, which come in many forms, from woodworking centers to ones with laser cutters and 3D printers. Think about how a maker space could be used to support entrepreneurs in your community. For example, one library provided sewing machines that were used by patrons to make tote bags, purses, and clothing for sale. I only attended half of this session, but I know that some of the other technology trends discussed included open source disruption, social media outreach, and using social media not only as a one-way communication vehicle with patrons, but as a two-way street by using it to collect information on what your communities actually want from you. Um, open licensing ebook innovations, and you can find out more about these technology trends at the LIDA website listed on the slide. Another session was unravelings, unreliable narrators, unputdownable stories. This was a moderated session with the authors of these three books, and the common theme of the books was unreliable narrators. The authors discuss character development, the settings of their books, and why they chose those, their writing processes, and their own favorite authors and genres. This was the only author talk that I went to during the ALA conference, and honestly, I wish I had gone to more, because it was very energizing to hear authors talk about their books and their approach to writing. At the end of the conference, I attended a meeting of the Collection Management and Public Libraries Interest Group, which is co-led by a chair from both the Association for Library Collection and Technical Services and the Reference and User Services Association. Both are divisions of ALA and obviously should have shorter names. And a lot of the time at this session was spent having people introduce themselves and talk about issues of interest to them. Some of the issues uh, that were mentioned include collection analysis, what, which was a common interest to a majority of the attendees. 
And other issues of note were uh, when are audiobooks going to die and be replaced by streaming resources? Collection space being replaced in the library by activity space as libraries begin giving more emphasis to programming. Dealing with e-resources and streaming resources. And dealing with restrictions on availability of items, such as items on Amazon that are available to Prime only members or Audible audio books that are available to Audible only members. Unfortunately, I had to leave this session early to catch the bus back home, but um, the session did uh, make me interested in joining one of these interest groups and special interest groups. So part of the fun of attending ALA is going to the exhibit hall. And there are, of course, hundreds of vendors exhibiting. So you have to pick your priorities and use your time wisely. Here are a few resources that might be of interest to you from my visits with vendors. Um, in the adult department at our library, we pick up advanced reader copies or ARCs of upcoming books from publishers. We let patrons take them home to read them, and then they let us know if they think the library should order this upcoming book. While visiting the Library of Congress booth, I learned that they have posted some old Sanborn maps online, and there will be more coming in future years. We've already talked about some novelist resources for book clubs, and you can find more novelist information at their YouTube channel. And I also learned that some libraries are piloting new streaming resources from companies such as GoChip and Canopy. Lastly, I'd like to just share a few tips with you if you have the chance to attend ALA in the future. Um, it's a very exciting but exhausting experience. So you need to arm yourself with some water and snacks and definitely wear comfortable shoes because you'll be walking from one end to the other of a very large exhibit hall multiple times a day. Um, I found it helpful to schedule a couple blocks of time for the exhibit hall. And I wish I had brought something with wheels on it because I picked up so many goodies. I was literally dragging a bag across the floor. Um, Plan your schedule in advance, but be flexible. You may show up at a session, and it might be full, or it might not be what you thought. So I found it helpful to have some backup sessions in mind. Um, decide what's more important to you. There's so much to do at ALA. There are information sessions, book buzz talks, seeing vendors, standing in line for signed copies of books. It's hard to do it all. Um, make sure you take time to talk with other attendees. You learn a lot from talking with people from other libraries. So for example, sit at a lunch table with someone you don't know and strike up a conversation. And take time to enjoy the city you're visiting. Um, do some sightseeing. And Denise will be sharing some photos of our sightseeing excursions in just a few moments. With that, I will turn it over to Denise. Good afternoon. Uh, much like Debbie, I'm extremely grateful to WVLS for the opportunity to be able to go to ALA. There's something very, very special about being at a national conference. The energy is high, and it just um, it, it motivates you to come back and, and do some interesting, fun things for your library. Because of um, the fact that I have worked in youth services for 15 years now, that was kind of my bent when I went and what I was looking to accomplish was to check out those sessions. But before I get into my first slide, I just wanted to mention that one thing that was really nice for us was we traveled down to Wausau from Rhineletter, which is only an hour, and uh, we're able to hop on the bus with the WVLS people and go down to Chicago as a group. And then we didn't have to worry about parking or driving in the city or any of that. So it was really very, very nice. The upper right-hand corner is one of the tunnels for the McCormick Place. That thing is just massive. It was a 15 to 20 minute commute every day. So you really had to kind of plan out your time frames when you were coming and going. Um, but it was wonderful to be able to have that. 
So being in the youth services section, um, and not oh, probably about two years ago, I had another scholarship opportunity where I was able to attend the new media training. It was an intensive two-day training on digital media and kids. And so this particular way to start the conference was great. No screen time under two. The AAP um, had some guidelines out a while ago that they have just recently changed. And I'm not going to um, talk about that too much. There's a link there if you'd like to read them on your own. But what I thought I'd just tell you is what the, the actual changes were. They're not huge. Um, in the past, uh, the AAP has said for kids younger than 24 months, no video or digital media use. This changed recently because of the ever-growing technology trends. And um, what they found, too, was that because people are living in different places, video chatting for kids that are in that age group is very, very useful to be able to have that human contact where they're actually seeing somebody, recognizing their grandma or grandpa's face, whoever it may be. Um, that can be a very useful media for children that age. Um, for kids over 24 months, they suggest just kind of introducing it at that point and be intentional about it. So making sure that the things that are seeing they are seeing are high quality. Um, and so we're going to, in just a second, I'm going to talk about apps. And they taught us, you know, one of the things they taught us was how to use or how to choose quality apps. And then for children two to five years of age, limiting that screen time, very, very important. But what is even more important than that is to do co-viewing with your children. They found that kids get the most out of media when they are engaged with an adult. That is very, very important. Um, they don't get near as much. And this was all done through the Judith Cooney Center uh, with Sesame Street. They did lots of studies that way and um, found that when parents were watching with their kids, the kids were getting more out of Sesame Street. So they're carrying that into the media part of this as well. Um, it, they talked a lot about how libraries can be media mentors. That can be done. One of the things um, when I attended the new media training was my goal was to come back and institute educational iPads. So these are not for checkout outside the library. We have them available for kids to check out and use right in the library. Um, and I've researched and found um, a good amount of educational apps. Kids seem to enjoy digital stories, games, learning opportunities, phonics things, letters, beginning reading apps. There's a lot of good stuff out there. It, the problem is it's hard to navigate because there's just a sea of apps out there. Um, so how do you do that? You know, that's, and I'll show you a resource for that shortly. The other thing is digital story times. And this you know, I became a believer after a while. I was kind of a skeptic in the beginning. Uh, but this particular instrument has been very useful on occasion for me. The story time you're seeing here is me with my normal group, the two to three and a half year olds. The problem with it is I do not have a screen to project. So I haven't been able to use the digital story times like I'd like to do. but. When I've subbed for my supervisor who does the older kids, I have the room where I'm able to do that. And the kids have just eaten it up. They've really, really enjoyed it. And again, it's engaging with somebody. They're not just looking at it passively. Um, so we all, we all get a lot out of that, the kids and I. Choosing apps. You know, I came out of the new media training, and I was just mind boggled at how to go about this. And what they said was a lot of it should be done like you would choose a physical book. So when you're doing reviews for ordering books, look at the illustrations. Are they too busy? Is the text age appropriate? Is it too much text um, where it's overwhelming for the child? You can use a lot of those things um, with the addition of a couple things such as um, pop-up ads, you know, you have to make sure that that's not happening within the app. Um, there are parent guides sometimes within these apps that are really, really useful that help show the parent how to use the app more uh, effectively with their kids. But 
the resources that uh, we were given were really, really good. The geeks with juniors.com, common sense media. If you're curiously scribbling, do not worry because these slides again are going to be available to you. Uh, and my favorite is digitalmediadiet.com. Carissa Christner is sort of a guru in this whole navigating the sea of apps business. And she, on the right column on that page, if you scroll down just a little bit, she has a list of sites that you can go to where you find quality app reviews. And um, I've signed up for ones to be sent to me via email, Facebook. I've gotten a lot of free apps that way. So in fact, I think I have one called Free App Friday. So uh, it's, it's really worth doing. And lastly on this topic is the AAP also has a link to making a family media use plan. And this is really great, especially with kids who are just a little bit older, because then they can be involved in choosing how the family spends their time and breaking it down. And sometimes it's eye-opening to find out exactly how much time technology is using up within a day and how the family wants to use that together. This was one of my favorite sessions. This was absolutely fascinating. Daniel Russell works for Google. And he talked about how it's very, very important for libraries to know how to search the, the internet um, in order to help their, really, really help their patrons find good information. I mean, let's face it, there's a lot of information out there, but what you get is not always quality or even accurate. So he really wanted to help us understand that sometimes we think we know a lot more than we actually do. And he gave us little tests that we could, you know, do with him to find out, oh, yeah, I guess I didn't know as much as I thought. Point being, um, little, little things to help you find. Control F. Okay, if you knew this beforehand, kudos to you because I did not know about Control F. I love Control F now. Thank you, Daniel Russell. <laughs> In fact, when I was looking for slides um, to help me put together uh, this webinar, I, I was searching and searching and I couldn't find it and then it hit me. Use control F and there it was really very quickly. So anyway, um, the ways, there are ways to improve your knowledge and he has a very, very good one, power searching with google.com. It is his self-paced course that you can do at your own level, your own time frame. Um, I have not started this yet, but I'm really looking forward to doing it to up my game in this so that when patrons come in, um, they're getting much more accurate information. And you have to know what is even possible to look for. You know, it, it, it just helps a lot to have that information. He also has um, a googleaday.com, which is a little exercise that you can do to see exactly where your search, searching skills are and to improve them. So, but he does have a definition um, of information literacy being deeply literate and that includes the internet, obviously. So very, very fascinating man. The keynote speaker with Sarah Jessica Parker was great. Um, as Debbie said, she was named chair of ALA's Book Club Central. And she grew up being a very, she calls herself an obsessive reader. And in her household, her mother would not let them leave the house without something to read. And this is something she incorporates with her own children today. Um, but what she said was, the quote, if the library is the heart of a community, then libraries keep the heart beating. And, you know, that just, it makes you feel warm and fuzzy inside, I guess, because then you know that what the work you are doing is actually touching somebody and helping somebody. It's, it's always a good reminder that what we do counts. Um, then they had a little kind of coffee clutch discussion between um, Sarah Jessica Parker and I. I can't remember what the lady in the middle of her name was, but Stephanie Powell Watts, which Debbie talked about, um, and she spoke of her book and how that came to be, and that is the first pick of the Book Club Central. So um, we were able to each get a free copy of the book or uh, e-reader e downloads, so that was very nice as well. But Sarah Jessica Parker was very down-to-earth, very warm, very funny, and um, she also really enjoyed her experience recently of being shushed in the library, so that was kind of fun. This particular session was a panel of people who worked their way up the ranks, so to speak. They addressed the gap sometimes between management and staff, 
and how it's important to bring everybody together because when you have a unified staff management and support staff, you know, you have a successful library. So they talked a lot about everybody bringing their skill sets to the table. A lot of the people that were on the panel started off as a page and worked their way up. Um, some of them had their masters, some of them did not. And, um, but they all talked about how that climb through the ranks kind of made them a better supervisor because they understood what it was like to be the support staff. How important it is to build confidence in the people around you so that they feel that what they're doing is important, their work is important. That there's effective communication because a lot of times that doesn't happen and then when you have gaps, um, it's, it's harder to communicate to your patrons what's going on as well if you've got gaps between management and staff or between floors and so forth. The one thing I really enjoyed was one of the men who was, um, he was in a big supervisor capacity, sharing a part of yourself. He decided that he was going to, he loves birthdays. Birthdays are his thing. So anytime anybody had a birthday in the library, he got them a card and a gift, and it was a big deal cake. I mean, but it was one way that he could connect um, with his staff and the people around him and share part of who he is and what he really enjoys. Um, providing opportunities for growth is big. I mean, I, I feel really grateful because uh, the supervisory staff at my library is fantastic for this. Um, I. I thrive on continuing ed. I'm kind of a junkie, so to speak. But it motivates me, and so I get these opportunities. A lot of times I come back and my boss says to me, so what are we doing now? And But it's always a very supportive, what are we doing now? Um, you know, he provides that atmosphere for me to do new things, and it, it's benefited the library, I believe. Um, respecting you for what you do, I think that kind of goes without saying. It's pretty much common sense. The titles are a big deal. One of the guys on the panel spoke of being in a larger academic setting. And he said when he was new, he went to sit in the lunchroom, and one of the higher-ups came up to him and said, you know what this area is and who regularly sits here? And he says, no, I didn't. And she said, well, you do now, correct? And he said, yes, I'm perfectly fine sitting here. And he stood his ground. But literally, this is what's out there sometimes, is that um, disconnect between management and staff. And um, the respect should be for everyone, that's for sure. And management does set the tone. I, again, I'm very, very fortunate to have the management I do at my library. Um, it has really, really enabled me to become uh, the person I feel like I have today, and, and that's evolved a lot over the last couple of years. One of the things I really enjoyed, too, was the off-session times. Um, going back and forth between the hotel and the convention center on the bus, you really got to know some people. So Debbie and I kind of sat next to each other right away because we didn't know anybody, and, and it was just a comfort thing. But then after that, um, we made a point, and we didn't always come and go at the same time to sit next to somebody. So we were talking to people from all over, LA, Kentucky, I mean, all, all kinds of places. Um, so the one lady up in the left corner had just bought that book that day, and she was reading it, and I looked at it and went, oh, that's really great. Um, so I took a screenshot so I could look it up when I got back. And the right-hand corner, this was a stage, a center stage, They, I believe they called it, or for, no, excuse me, front porch. And they had musical acts all day long, every day, which was really nice because if you needed just kind of a break because you were being overwhelmed by everything, you could go and just listen to a few minutes of music, take a deep breath, and then go back at it. Um, the bottom middle picture is just navigating that convention center, which is huge. And as Debbie said, you're walking and walking and walking. And sometimes I would get to one end of it and go, oh, how did I get here? I'm supposed to be on the other end and I have to walk completely to the other end. So it, it's a lot of um, miles during the day. The bottom right-hand corner is a book signing line. Um, I did not do any book signings because of this. It took a large amount of your time just to stand in line and wait for that. So 
kind of skipped those, but um, I know a lot of people got a lot out of that. There were some libraries who used the question, you know, what, what if, I have a typo there, but what if early literacy looked like play? And meaning that you're not providing a guided activity for this, these kids, you're just providing the activity and giving the kids the freedom to be able to move and do within that activity. And what, what would that do? What would that do for the kids? What would that do for the library? Um, and especially concentrating on the STEAM, which is big these days, obviously. So three of their programs were this Explore on the Floor, this could include messy play, um, so you have to have a space, obviously, that is good for that. Foam ice, ice cube braces. Um, I saw uh, pool noodles cut in half, and then you send the ice cubes down. How fun is that? I mean, you know, <laughs> when you're a youth services person, you get a kick out of a lot of this stuff. But uh, just, you know, kids love that kind of repetition, that, that just that fun of being able to explore on their own. They had an after-school project where kids were able to get involved with SNAP circuits and different uh, STEAM and STEM activities, um, you know, little, uh, uh, like uh, the Minecraft clubs and things like that. Um, this was very successful as well. And something that I think every library could think about if you have a decent showing at your school, at your library after school, I think they may have even went into the schools to do some of this as well. What I really liked as well is they, they told us what didn't work for them. So that, that was very helpful because, you know, when you engage in something like this, it's pretty overwhelming at first. Um, so to get a few common sense items, such as we bought things too quickly, and then they didn't really research them and found that they weren't real popular with the kids. Um, I think with WVLS, we have a great opportunity to have those kits that we can get our hands on and be able to let the kids use and see if it would work for our library. So um, we've already done that quite a few times in our department and I would encourage you, if you haven't checked it out, it's a good thing to check out. When I was um, looking at doing the early literacy story time breaks at our library, I looked in the back room, um, took apart some kits and things to see what is it that I can incorporate that we already have into these things, and that's one thing that they suggested to do because everybody's got those things in their back room that can be used um, or recycled. And walk through the space. Is there are there places you can use more accurately, more efficiently? Um, their bent was to integrate programming space and collections, and I think Debbie mentioned too that programming is beginning to be a big deal in libraries. And that was proved by the fact that they cut their circulation budget by 30% and still saw an increase in, in circulation in 10%. But that was because they took that money and they put it toward the programming, toward these, these programs. So very, very interesting to see. Um, once in a while when a session was full or something like that, uh, you, you had to find something else to do. I happened to run into these two gals, which really was thrilling. They went, one of them went to the new media training with me, and um, one, the, her session was full, my session wasn't working for me, and so we just networked, and we sat together and discussed how new media was going, what we were doing, what was successful, and that, that was very nice, because we just don't see each other on a regular basis. So to be able to get together and do that um, was great. This particularly, particular library, Mary Glendening, um, they were having things like Minecraft camps or um, after school clubs, which was great, except for that they were all being attended by boys. And so they asked the question, you know, how do we get girls involved in this? this, this we really want girls to be able to attend to. Um, they questioned about funding and that kind of activities that you would run during this thing. Can you find people in your community that would be able to do that? Or do you have to find the money to be able to bring somebody in? That's a big deal for a lot of libraries. So she spoke a lot on how they made those things happen. Um, the two resources that were really, really important for me during this was the connected camps. Um, she found a lot of great information on there to help with these camps that they did. And what they did was they put together a week-long camp for girls. And it was only part of the day. It wasn't a full day. 
Um, but it was Monday through Friday, and um, this gave them a lot of information that they could um, use to, to create these camps. The top resource was my very favorite, just because I think for girls this is really an important thing. This particular website is about students at, at collegiate schools that are cheerleaders, but they are also in science-based um, programs for their, their um, degrees. So they actually had a list of the cheerleaders and how you could contact them to see if you wanted them to come to your library and do a presentation. And I just thought girls would really enjoy something like that. I mean, I think a lot of us as women really always kind of wanted to be a cheerleader when you were in school. And if you didn't get to be, you can see that you can have it both ways. You don't have to just be, you know, um, the fun, pretty one who's out there. That you can have, have it all, this, the science part as well. So that was really fascinating. <laughs> the exhibit hall, as Debbie said, it was massive. I mean, you just really had to uh, use blocks of your time. And then you also had to know when to stop. I literally had two huge bags across my shoulders one day, and I knew I had gotten to work out because with all the walking I had done with those bags on my shoulders, um, there had to be a few calories burned. But as you can see in the left bottom corner, it, you know, it was just packed with people. Um, but you got a lot of freebies to take home, and it was fun to talk to some of the vendors. They had, oh, I think I got in on a card game with other people. It was a kid's card game, something that you can employ in a passive after-school program. Um, and, of course, they had fun little photo ops and things, and uh, I got a kick out of that because I was just jokingly saying now to the, to the guy who was running this, does my hair look okay? I want it to look good in the fan. And I just I was just kidding. So he blew it on me full force. <laughs> it's just, it was funny because it, it, it was just fun. Um, up in the right-hand corner, the pop-top stages were really fun because if you had a few minutes in between and you wanted to see an author, you could just hop in for a couple of minutes and listen until you had to head to your next session. This is Marcus Fister. Um, if you don't know him, he authored and the book Rainbow Fish, which is hugely popular with kids. He was the first one to bring about the foil design books. And as much as that was well loved by the public, publishers were not a fan. So it took some doing to get that going, but uh, boy, we sure are glad he did. And the little, the little chat box is in my corner, but I don't know if you can see on the screen next to him, Rainbow Fish is in the corner there. So. So there were lots of extra activities. There was never a dull moment. I mean, you were constantly going. This was a, probably my very favorite session, the Charlemagne Robbins, uh, or excuse me, Charlemagne Rollins President Program. Charlemagne, Charlemagne Rollins was the first African-American woman to be given uh, an honorary membership in ALA. So this is a big deal. But talking about plugging into the digital age and what libraries are involved with um, today, they had some really great speakers for this. And joint media engagement is kind of a new buzz term um, these days. And it's just co-viewing and talking to parents about that. And of course, Fred Rogers and his center has done some amazing work with this kind of thing. And he's the one who said, if you strengthen a parent, then you strengthen the child. And so that's what they were referring to in these sessions was how to strengthen the parent. Sarah Little from the Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences was amazing. She has done tons of research into this, um, saying that because of the research and we know how kids learn, we're just going to use that in the, in the digital media platform and use the same things that we know for that to make digital media effective. And that can be foreground media, which are the apps, intentional. The background media I found interesting, they said it's TV is almost like secondhand smoke of today. Um, it, it's disruptive to the family unit as a whole because parents are distracted, kids are distracted, it inter interrupts their play. Um, so at least when you're co-viewing, when you're engaging with your kids, then that will make that media effective. The content that really helps learning, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking of Dora. And you know, so many kids love her, but it's the familiar characters. She uses a lot of music within those programs. They're always using, asking the kids questions. 
Do you see Swiper? When you do, say Swiper, no swiping, and it gives the ch kids a chance to get involved. And the repetition, of course, kids love repetition. But they found with the talking toys, the leapfrogs and so forth, that um, the, the parents were not interacting as much with the kids. The kids had fewer words. They were talking less. And of course, the interaction was not there. There are some free training modules on that that you can look at. If you have not seen Chip Donahue, if you can see him and you're at all in the digital media market, you need to, to hear him. He is amazing. He's so passionate about what he does. And the sheer fact that he talks about thinking ahead, how do we want our kids to grow up? You want them to be empowered to know that they're actually smarter than the technology they're using. So that's really important. And in order to do that, we have to get parents to see what they're doing with their own technology. How much time are they spending on it? I see kids all the time in the library, put that phone down. They, they want their parents' attention. And the next line, he comes up with these all the time. The more you connect, less you connect. But what he did was he put, the more you connect with your child, the less you connect with media. And the more you connect with media, the less you connect with your child. So um, that goes right into the next one, which is connection is inevitable, but, the, but distraction is definitely a choice. And, but there's a healthy way to do that, and that's engaging families and letting them know that we're here to help them. Um, the power of nudges, so we're not judging them, we're not lording over them, but we're trying to help empower them to know that they are their kid's best teacher. And one of his great suggestions, I thought, was to have a parent tech playtime, sharing those apps. What, you know, what did my kids find that was really helpful in the learning department, or what did we enjoy together? And last was um, Lisa Regala, and she talked a lot about how you can connect the physical and the digital. Um, and I'll let you read the rest on that, because I just want to touch really quickly on Exploring Chicago, because that was a big part of this, and Debbie and I really enjoyed our time exploring the city. Um, one of the things that we did was we decided that one of us joined me. We were each going to pick one thing we really wanted to do and make sure that we got to do that for the other one. So um, you want to tell them real quick about your first one? Well, um, I'm kind of a foodie, and Rick Bayless, who is a famous chef from Chicago, a Mexican chef, um, this was kind of one of my dreams to actually go to one of his restaurants. And because um, I'm so directionally challenged, I actually took Denise in circles for almost an hour around Chicago trying to find this restaurant. So we were really hungry by the time we got there. But um, we got to go to Frontera Grill, which is right next to um, his some of his other restaurants, including Tupelo Bombo, which you see the picture up there. So we had great uh, salsa and guacamole. And uh, so that was one thing I could check off my bucket list and was very excited about. <laughs> I, my pick was Navy Pier because I'd never gotten to do that before. The, the big lips and tongue, there was a celebration of the Rolling Stones going on and their uh, music. So those were all over Navy Pier, different ones, different designs. One of the things we both heard about was the architectural tour, boat tour. It was fabulous. Mm -hmm. If you ever get a chance, that is one thing. We enjoyed that, um, but we were told that by several people. So um, the bottom left hand or right hand corner was the city from Navy Pier at sunset. And then of course Chicago is stunning at night, just stunning. And to walk among all those skyscrapers and big buildings is just an experience beyond belief. And we did, we were able to hit on the um, recommendation of one of my friends, a jazz club, one of the top ten in Chicago, and it was fabulous mm -hmm. as well. So um, we were really grateful to be able to get that in as well. So. Well, thank you, ladies. I, we do have five minutes left for some questions, so I'll check on the chat box here. So I know you guys mentioned about the book club extravaganza coming in October, but I know that you have a million projects zooming through your heads right now, but do you have a couple that are on the horizon that were inspired by your experiences, or do you have special projects that you need to do right now? Um, I know there's tons of resources that you shared with us, but what are you, what do you plan on that? I think one of the things that um, our director has been talking with me about is to do a digital media class with parents to
to help them to choose quality apps and um, to help them navigate that sea, and also to inform them, you know, how technology can be beneficial if used in the right way. So I think that's kind of one one place where we're going there. How about you, Debbie? Yeah, well, like you said, I mentioned the book club extravaganza we'll be doing next month, and there are hundreds of book kits that are actually available to us to order for book clubs through uh, WISCAT and some of the other resources that I shared, and so we're really looking forward to sharing those with book clubs in our area. And was there something that surprised you or took you out of your comfort level? As, I mean, the of course, at the conference, you're always out of your comfort level, but was there something that just blew you away? I think the conference as a whole, I, when I wrote my, um, my essay for the application for the scholarship, you know, I talked about how this jazz is me, and when I came home, I wrote to Ann and told her that the three things I came away with were I felt empowered, educated, and energized. That, that's, you know, that, I come away with that big thing on me and I can't wait to implement things and feel so fortunate to work where I do. Yeah, I agree with Denise. I think you just, you always get energized coming back from a conference like this mm -hmm. because you get so many great ideas and you're learning new things and I think, um, you know, the point about networking too with other people and just how great a resource that is. You know, I have um, business cards from people I met and, and be able to follow up with them afterwards to exchange information. You know, somebody who was at a smaller library at ours actually um, built her own collection analysis uh, methodology and to be able to make contact with her and get more information. And, you know, it's great to be able to build that kind of network. And I know, you know, I've experienced myself, you know, I think about going to a conference or a workshop and there's always that anxiety, that pressure, that nervousness, but I don't smell any of that on you guys. I feel like you guys are cannonballs shooting out of a rocket or a can you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean you just you just come back fearless. Yeah. Absolutely fearless. Yeah. I think that's the empowerment part. Yeah. You know, you you go in, you feel like you have no clue as to what you should do in this situation, and then you get some guidelines and some ideas on how you can actually go about this, and then your own ideas start flowing, and mm -hmm. you make it your own. So. Yeah, tell me more about adapting, you know, a national conference to Wisconsin. How do you do that? How do you take every? How do you take in a session when it's so large? <laughs> um, well, I think you have to, you know, pick and choose. Um, and that's really, there. there's no way you could do everything at that conference. So you have to kind of pick and choose what's most important to you. And then when you come back, you have lots of new ideas. But one of the challenges I, I always find with coming back is you have limited time because you still have your regular job. Mm -hmm. So kind of picking and choosing what you think are some of the best ideas that apply to your library mm -hmm. that that would be useful for your community and that is actually practical for you to implement, uh -huh. you know, that's how you can get value from the conference. Wonderful. All right, well, it looks like it's 1.59. Do you ladies have any last words before we start <laughs> today? This is, again, a thank you. It was an incredible opportunity, and we're just so grateful to have been able to go. Yeah, and we urge everybody listening to apply mm -hmm. for the scholarship. It was um, really made this possible for us. We should do. Well, thank you. And, again, more information on scholarships and grants are on the WVLS website. So thanks for joining us today.